Hi there everyone, welcome back to the Royal Society where we have another special guest. Today, it is David Eisenbart, a longtime friend and collaborator of mine, very esteemed mathematician and director of the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California. But David, today you're on our turf. Yeah. We're here with head librarian at the Royal Society, Keith Moore, and we're going to be talking about a guy that you requested called Arthur Cayley. Why did you request Arthur Cayley? Well, Arthur Cayley has been 150 years ago doing work that's very close to the work that I've been doing. What did he look like? Uh huh. <laughs> yes, so here we are. Here is Arthur Cayley. Oh my. This is probably somewhere between 1854, 5, and 1860, that kind it's of thing. Awfully well preserved. Yeah. He was one of the first people to work with free resolutions. He worked with ruled surfaces, which is a preoccupation of mine. He discovered the 27 lines on the cubic surface. And his work has come into prominence recently again in working with hyperdeterminants. All right. And a lot of things that he's done which are modern and important. Bit of a big deal by the yeah. sounds of it. What's he done with his hair there? He's oiled his hair down at the top and it's, it's puffing out at the back. Yep. See, David, you want to talk about hyperdeterminants, and I'm giving you buffant Fashion tips. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, now he was a fellow of the Royal Society, a great honour for any mm -hmm. mathematician or scientist. And if you don't believe us, we have proof. This is Cayley's election certificate. So this would have been hung in the meeting rooms mm. and fellows of the Royal Society would read the name, look at the statement on the election certificate, and then they decide to support it or not. Mm -hmm. Before you begin with the supporters, let's mm. look what he did. He was the discoverer of hyperdeterminants, mm -hmm. distinguished for his acquaintance with the science of mathematics. Although it says he's a barrister. He was in between. Keith, I never realized that this is what happened with these certificates. They were hung up almost in like a semi-public place. Yeah. And you would just go and put your moniker on it if you That's thought right. they were yes. up to it. We've got William Thompson, Lord Kelvin was second there. Very good name to have on there. We have Richard Owen of natural history fame. He's one of Charles Darwin's great rivals. And of mm. course, he, he establishes the Natural History Museum. And of course, he's not a mathematician. So he's getting support from a broad range of sciences mm. here. So it's a little surprise that when the ballot happened on what looks like the 3rd of 20th. June, 1852, elected, as we see written oh, there. See, yeah. He's in the club. OK, let's have a look at a little bit of the mathematics. Now, David's been poring over several manuscripts already. We've only brought one upstairs to show you, but rest assured, there are loads of them down in the archives. And I, I wept to leave them behind. I know, I think, I think you may well be back just quietly, but let's have a look at yeah. the one we brought okay. upstairs. First of all, Keith, this is a manuscript for philosophical transactions? That's right. So these are the manuscripts that were sent to the Royal Society for publication. They're collected by year. And this is, as you can see, a paper that was read before the Royal Society was received. 1856, I think it says, yes, by George Gabriel Stokes, endorsed, and you can read the title here. So there are a number of things in this paper which strike me as interesting because they're different than what mm. we do today. So they're interested in the solution of equations, systems of equations of higher order. Mm. And one of the funny things is they write them differently than we would. I would write a times x to the m plus b times x to the m minus 1y plus c times something. But this is a much more efficient notation. He just writes out the coefficients, a, b, c. He doesn't even bother to write them all, times x comma y to the m, by which he means that m plus 1 tuple of powers. When I read something that's written in Old English, I think, oh, isn't it funny how they used to write? Uh, right. This is the mathematical equivalent. This yes. is using an old notation. Mm -hmm. But I want to jump and look at what's coming next, which are these funny diagrams. So a polynomial is, you can write as a string of coefficients. A matrix, it's a two-dimensional array of numbers that could mean many things. They appear all the time in social sciences and in statistics and everywhere in mathematics now. But he wants to write higher dimensional arrays. And uh, he gets quite original with this. There's the beginning. He's showing what he can do. And then here's an ordinary determinant. This is the way we would write a determinant. This is the same determinant expanded in what I would call the Cayley expansion. And then we're getting fancier, and we're writing more determinants. But I want to really show you these things. Wow. So I haven't studied this carefully, but I think that he's writing a higher dimensional determinant in this way. These are two planes of a cube, maybe many planes. So he wants to explain how to expand a hyperdeterminant, unless I'm mistaken. 
It's they're nice quite looking. beautiful, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're quite gorgeous. beautiful. You know, you've thought a lot about Arthur Cagley and he's someone you're really interested yeah. in. And here's like his handwritten work and his handwriting and his That's work. Right. What's that like for you? Are you so absorbed by the mathematics that you're not thinking about <laughs> that? Or? Yes, to be honest. Okay, well, this seems like a good point to move on to something else because another thing about David's job as the director of a math institute is that he has to deal with money and grants and funding applications and things like that. And it seems like this has been a thing for many, many years. Because look what we've got here with Arthur Cayley himself. Keith, what have we got? Well, these are uh, administrative letters sent in to the Royal Society. Here we have one of Arthur Cayley, and he's writing to George Gabriel Stokes. And he says, I venture to ask the Council of the Royal Society if they will grant me £10 from the donation fund to procure calculations. So he's asking for money to, to, to do a bit of donkey work, if you like. He, he wants a calculator to do some work. The Royal Society, will it give him £10? The National Science Foundation gives me money to buy computers, so why not? Ah, well, it's, it's the same thing, surely. Yes. He wants to know explicitly invariants of binary quintics. This was a preoccupation in this part of the 19th century. Invariant theory was the main subject, and the way it was pursued was to calculate more and more of these explicit invariants and covariants. And this came to a kind of climax. They wanted to know actually whether they were finite in number, the finite generators. And the reason he's excited about this is that somebody has just proved that there is a, only a finite number where he writes, I had supposed infinite, and the actual number is 23. There remain four covariants which have yet to be calculated. These are going to be horrendous formulas that no one will ever want to look at again. But nevertheless, this was the style of the day. David, I'm going to drop my favorite piece of objectivity knowledge that I drop into numerous videos now. Do you uh, happen to know why there's a black border around that letter? Is it because he died? Well, you're close. The writer was in mourning for someone else who died. I see. Hmm. Believe me to remain yours very sincerely. And he did remain that because he got the grant. <laughs> he did. Let's just dot the I's and cross the T's here on this one then. Please mention at the Royal Society Council that I have procured the calculation by Mr. W.B. Davis, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. There's our donkey. Right. Exactly right. Of the remainder, that is to say all those not given in my memoir in Quantics of the 23 fundamental covariants, because there are more. As you see, this is the mathematician in him. To say there were 23 covariants, that would be wrong. There are infinitely many, but there are 23 fundamental ones. Although he has squeezed yeah. in the fundamental. Right. <laughs> all right. And that I have verified all the results. I, I hesitate to believe that, actually. I am not immediately at leisure to write the memoir which will contain these results, but I hope to do so before long. He took the money, he got the result. You hope uh, he yeah. publishes it. Well, maybe he felt that was enough. I don't know. <laughs> Believe me, yours sincerely, Arthur Keeley. Cambridge, 24th of November, 1869. There we go. Yeah. A, a little snapshot into Arthur Cayley, your mathematical hero. Yes. What do you think? Has this been an enjoyable one? And indeed it has, yes. Would you like to go back Fine downstairs now? We'll take you downstairs to see the rest of the mathematics. I think I've had it for today. You're done? <laughs> <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> so we have a bunch of minerals. All of this presumably has come from Russia. They were mined yes, or that, found that's in right. Russia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Each one's got a label. There are two elephants in the room. Let's deal with them first. This one is falling apart. <laughs> That's right, it's presumably reacting to the air or to moisture, and as you can see, it's crumbling quite nicely there. And according to my list of contents, that is actually pyrite made from iron and sulfur. 